This is the AD History Podcast. Brought to you via London and New York City. You are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo, and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. And Patrick, something that's really going to be unusual about this episode is that for the most part, save our annual How Will Future Historians Remember the Previous Year that we always include in the first episode that we record of the following year after the new year. In this case, this is something that you and I cannot by any means skirt past. This is something that is historically significant in the extreme. And that, of course, is the recent invasion of Ukraine. And I believe we are currently in day seven or day eight of that conflict. This is history happening right before us. And me and you discussed this, pool. We said we wanted to talk about this in some capacity, some way, shape or form. And eventually, rolled from just sort of mentioning it in the middle of an episode. And that kind of evolved into a whole episode about Ukraine and the historical importance of it, the historical relevance, how we got to this sort of point, all that sort of stuff. Um, normal scheduled programming will commence for our next episode, of course, but we just had to take a moment. I mean, we get so bogged down in talking about the past, but history is happening right before us. This is catastrophic history going on as we speak. Um, it was just something we need to talk about because it's just such a huge event happening in world history right now. And it's, it's a very unusual thing because mm. history in this case is so deeply wrapped up in everything that has occurred, both in the lead up to this war and, of course, everything that's involved in this war, a lot of it having to do with basically three main elements I think you and I are going to address here today. One, of course, is Russia, Ukraine, their relevant history together, and, of course, the West via NATO. Mm. And one of the reasons why this, I believe, really required uh, you and I to weigh in is because when you look at the lead-up to this war, Something that is undeniable and in some ways very unusual, though not unprecedented, is that in justification for this war, Vladimir Putin obviously sat down, got up in front of his entire nation, got up in front of the world, and basically told everybody why Ukraine is not a country, why it does not exist, it is a historical mistake, and that it is rightfully a part of Russia, and it is in some way a proxy and agent of the agenda of Western powers, specifically via NATO, in its desire to eventually, one, join the European Union, which I believe is actually enshrined in the country's current constitution. And the, two, the second one, which I don't know that is as well, but also having for some time expressed a desire to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, also known as NATO. And this is particularly difficult because when we're talking about what we know today as Russians and what we know today as Ukrainians, in many respects, they, they see each other at least culturally, in some respects to be sure, as being something somewhat kindred, specifically going back to the Middle Age entity known as Kievan Rus, which of course was based in its capital around what we know today as Kiev or Kiev, depending on how you want to pronounce that. I've been calling it Kiev all of my adult life, so I, apologies yeah. on that one, but I'm going to continue calling that out of pure habit, so forgive me. I knew this, I knew this city as Kiev for... Ever? Forever. It was only in the recent events I realized that this name had changed to Kiev. I didn't even... I think it's a pronunciation was... issue or maybe a language issue. Yeah, it slipped right past me. But no, um, Kiev, Kiev, I will most likely probably flicker, flitter between the two of these. No, you're completely right, Paul. These two nationals, these two people, have a, they do have a close relationship. That cannot be denied. Like most, I, was, I think like, what, what, one of the uh, pieces of research I did today said that most Ukrainians do also speak Russian. It's very common to speak the two languages, but just because they're similar doesn't mean they're one and the same. It doesn't mean one belongs to the other. That, and history tells us that history, like Ukraine and Russia, have a long separated history. They do. And if mm. we're talking about cultural similarities and cultural ties that are common to both of them, absolutely. You can draw mm. that back to Kievan Rus'. 
But if we are talking about the state of Russia that we have come to know, that basically begins with what we call in the West and in English, medieval Muscovy, which eventually we knew as the Grand Duchy of Moscow, which of course was ruled by a number of people, I believe it was under the heel of the Tatar Khanate for quite a long time. Then it fell into the control of the Ivans. And then, of course, in time, electing Alexander I, Alexander Romanov as Tsar, which created a basically a three centuries long dynasty of Tsarism under the Romanovs. And where does Kiev and Ukraine fall in all of this. Well, through a lot of its history, especially when you start talking more, you start moving into the Middle Ages, you get into the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Ukraine was not viewed by its stronger neighboring powers as, as a state or even necessarily as a distinct people because they effectively over that time end up under the heel of three separate major powers. You obviously have the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, you have the Austro-Hungarians, and of course you have the Russians, and eventually the Russian Empire. But in terms of the actual incorporation of what we would know today as Ukraine historically and its incorporation into Russia, you actually have to go back into the 1600s, specifically what we know today as the Treaty of Peryozlov. It was conducted by the Cossack Hedemate and the Russian Empire in 1654. This was preceded by nearly a decade of anti-Polish uprisings in the area broadly we know today as Ukraine, where in this case, in league with Russia, the Cossack Hedemate sought military protection against Poland in which case the Cossacks gave oaths of loyalty to the Russian Tsar, as did other relevant officials. This loyalty actually lasted into the First World War. The agreement itself proved instrumental in kicking off the Russo-Polish War that lasted between 1654 and 1667. This led to the so-called Eternal Peace Treaty in 1686, which formally recognized Russia's supremacy over much of the land that today we would recognize as Ukraine. So historically, that's the big piece that really brought them into the fold, specifically throughout what we would call the Romanov dynasty and creating those territorial legacies in regards to historical precedent. And for the most part, all of them, and this is, these are largely the words of Anne Applebaum, who, if you're not familiar with her, is basically one of the superstar intellectuals and mm. historians and writers who have focused she's so much. She is. She's yeah. most famous for writing her history on the Gulag system. She recently penned Red Famine, of course. Of course, she also wrote about the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War as well. She's quite fantastic, very insightful. You know, you can find her. She writes for The Atlantic. She writes for The Washington Post. She writes for a whole bunch of people. I think she's even been associated with the Hoover Institution for some time. And something that she has made fairly clear in that time is whatever three powers those were, they kind of looked at Ukraine as something of a colony, if you want to mm. put it in any way in particular. And I believe I was listening to one of her talks recently as well, Paul, and she was talking about that sort of history of Ukraine, how it wasn't seen as like this actual uh, entity unto itself. But that kind of has really shaped the mentality of the Ukrainian people today, how they see themselves as like history's rogues, if that's the best term for it. History's rebels might be the better term. Like a lot of their folklore heroes of people are like protest leaders, rebels, that sort of thing. It's just that is kind of the national psyche that they are this sort of band of people who are together despite others not wanting them to, to be together. That's that's been the public conscious for the nation for so long now, it seems. Yeah, they do have kind of a rebel roguish mentality mm. in this regard. And of course, the state that we know as Ukraine today and translated from, I believe it's Russian, Ukraine it means borderlands. Yeah, so this is where the whole debate of the um, definitive article of Ukraine comes in. The whole It was historically known as the Ukraine because when it was part of the USSR, when it has... And the Russian history, Empire. 
uh, part of the Russian Empire. It was the borderland, hence why it had the Ukraine, because you called it the borderland of Ukraine. But since being its own independent entity, it's just Ukraine. That's where that origin comes from. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you're talking about Ukraine, the Ukraine we know today, which is why I'm saying Ukraine we know today, mm, yes, is not the first time that we have seen and it's just an attempt at Ukrainian independent statehood. This is not something that is unique to 1991. In fact, you can go back partly to 1917 through 1920, when after the fall of the Tsar and the February Winter Revolution, which of course is different than the Bolshevik coup that's also known as the October Revolution, that they made an attempt to form an independent Ukrainian state, but neither the provisional government that was in at the time what they called Petrograd, which we know today as St. Petersburg, it's also known during the Soviet period as Leningrad, were willing to even hear them out. And undeniably, the Bolsheviks, when they took power, wanted to hear none of it either. Because one thing that both of those sides had in common, which is to say the provisional government, as well as the Bolsheviks, if they had anything in common at all, it's that none of them, all of them having been brought up, educated, and raised in the Russian Empire, would have had any reason to look at Ukraine, even potentially, as an independent state. They would have looked at it and did look at it as merely Southwest Russia. At the time, naturally, Ukraine was a land that was largely agrarian and largely peasant populated. And certainly when you look at it from the Bolshevik point of view, is that when it came to peasants, and this was certainly something true that Marx had made very clear, is that the peasants were in a class because they had no class consciousness, okay? They had mm. no ability to represent their interests. And a lot of the Bolsheviks tended to agree with this because they studied and discussed it constantly. Lenin had a very different conception comparatively, which was... He believed that they could be a class, but they needed to be tutored by the working class. And while he very much approved of their desire at the time, especially when you're talking about getting rid of all the landed gentry, once, of course, the Romanov dynasty had fallen, he was very much in favor of what their, their radical land reform, which was basically take it over and it's ours now, which is what they did. But while he also very much approved of the concept of their self-determination. He did not support their self-determination. And this is where we get into the whole uh, Putin claiming Lenin invented Ukraine in Which one is of his bollocks. more recent speeches. It is absolute bollocks, of course that is. And if there could be any ideas how to Putin came to the idea, other than he just made it up, which is most likely the case, I guess you could argue it, but no. Uh, Lenin did not create Ukraine. No, he didn't. In fact, Ukrainians created Ukraine. But the thing exactly. is, they failed to achieve and maintain the independence that they had aspired to after the fall of the Tsar. And they were conquered by the Red Army. And in regards to Kiev, isn't it much, much older than Moscow? Significantly older. Yeah, like an ancient, much, much older city. Kiev was a major city when... The, what we know today as mm. Moscow was just little more than a, a tiny settlement. And a great analogy um, I heard about this, and especially resonates with myself as a member of the United Kingdom, is the comparison of Russia and Ukraine to the comparison of the United Kingdom and Ireland I was in just the about 19th, to bring that up. 18th century. It's, it's such a powerful comparison. Obviously, today, Ireland's sovereignty and independence, well, the Republic of Ireland anyway, is very much recognized, but I believe, and my dates might be wrong on this, I believe um, Ireland, as in the whole island of Ireland, uh, became part of the United Kingdom in 1802. And obviously it was independent before then and is now partially independent now. And, uh, you know, Ireland has its own culture. Ireland has a bloody strong image, culture, language, history. It's very much its own thing. And that was something the UK at that time, Great Britain, England, whatever you want to call it, just didn't agree with and see at the time. Not at all. In fact, I was discussing mm. this very point with my brother a few days ago. Mm. And when he was mentioning 
the breakaway in eastern Ukraine, which of course has been going on since 2014, mm. he made a great point. He said, let me add an addendum to that. In the case of the portions of Luhansk and Donetsk that have obviously been trying to break away and doing so with the support, albeit unofficially, though we all know that they were there with the Russians, is you could even make a, a case where you could compare them to Northern Ireland. Mm, yeah, that's a perfect analogy, especially yeah, on, on, on today's sort of landscape. They are very much... In that analogy, they perfectly fit the role of Northern Ireland. That, that cannot be denied. I just thought for anyone, especially um, in my home nation of the UK, for anyone who's not being able to fully understand the point of this and the issue, just that analogy helps amazingly, I think. Absolutely. And on top of that, you know, when we start talking about cultural issues as well, mm. obviously, if you were to look at Ireland and the United Kingdom, there are definitely some similarities in culture that they share. But there's course, obviously yeah. considerable differences. Something that's interesting, though, in the case of the Ukrainian language, viewed for a very long time and clearly by some still today, is they look at it as a patois of Russian. Mm. I can see that. And for many, many years, apparently it was even illegal. This was not under the Soviet period. This is under the czar to speak Ukrainian in public. So the history of banning language goes far and wide. Um, it's a really interesting, well, morbidly interesting subject. It, it it's a form of repression we see so often in the in the playbook of history. Banning a language, you know, language is so central to a people's identity. The way we speak is so fundamental to that. And removing how a group of people can speak, removing the right for them to use their own language, is damaging. It's damning. Um, it is. But no, Ukrainian is very much its own unique language. Of course, it's a Slavic language, a Eastern Slavic language, I believe, as is Russian. There are undeniably similarities between the two, but no, it's its own thing. It's its, thing on the, it, it's its own thing. Absolutely. That, and of course, whether it be under the Russian Empire and to some extent under the Soviets, mm -hmm. there was some element, of course, naturally, of Russification. And so mm -hmm. you'll, you'll encounter, even today, a great many Ukrainians who speak both Russian yeah. and Ukrainian. And a great example of this, and I've forgotten his name, but the current president of Ukraine. Zelensky. Zelensky, that's the one. In that fantastic speech of his on the eve of invasion, he, just to prove the point, he freely moved from Ukrainian to Russian to prove that, he, to show how close we see these countries are together, but to show, yeah, to show that there are ties between them in those sort of ways. And it's just impressive to do it. You know, and, and right now, basically, something that we're looking very seriously at here is the fact that when it comes to Ukraine and Russia, it gets even more complicated from there, to be sure, because naturally they were forcefully conquered and eventually incorporated into what we know as the so Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They were a sub-republic of that, so the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. And the relationship, especially early on, between Ukraine and the Soviet Union was not a pretty one. They did not no. come into that by choice. They may have found various people within Ukraine that would be willing to follow their edicts and act as administrators and viceroys and what have you, but there's a particularly dark history there in a number of ways, but especially... And most importantly, when it came to the realities of, one, forced collectivization under Stalin, and two, prior to World War II, the persecution and the repression of the Orthodox Church. And these things did not play well. In the case of collectivization, there is a lot of debate, naturally, about was that intentional in terms of the lives that were lost, which obviously would imply a genocide. This is what the Ukrainians today call the Holodomor, or terror famine. Mm. Or was it simply a matter of really, really bad policy that should not have been enact enacted, and the way it was enacted was criminal? And that debate goes on. What I can tell you, though, without a doubt, is that for all that it's worth, 
the collectivization of agriculture was always very problematic. They did not truly have the means to facilitate and organize that properly, in addition to the fact that it was being done out of necessity, and that necessity was to then take that har those harvested crops, mostly wheat, and then export them to wherever to be able to get hard foreign currency, because when the Soviets took over as the successor state to the Russian Empire, they also basically abrogated any responsibility that they had to Tsarist debts, which means that they could not borrow money from the outside world, and when you are trading your crops away to get hard currency, that allowed them to undertake their rapid industrialization in order to acquire materials, bring in experts from the outside world, which they did, industrial experts to build these steel plants, to build these tractor plants, mm. cars, tanks, all of these airplanes. It was a necessity in the eyes of Stalin and those who were around him. Of course, it also meant that millions of peasants starved and that the requisition rate of all of that grain and everything else they were growing did not really go at all to the peasant farmers on the collective farms who were doing it. Hence, you have starvation. In addition to the fact, other than the first year, so we're talking between 31 and 33, the estimate is that between 2 and 3 million Ukrainians died, in addition to things like the persecution of the so-called kulaks, the mm. so-called rich peasant farmers, who, mm. might I add, if you had more than one cow, you could be considered a kulak and then sent off. Yeah. But they were also the people who knew what they were doing. And I feel like this ties us in very nicely to talking about Russia in all of this, Paul. Yes. Um, Russia throughout history, a lot of people are saying, why are Russia doing this now? Why is Putin doing this now? And a lot of it ties into fundamentally throughout history, as we saw the rapid industrialization under Stalin, Russia somewhat always wanted to play catch up throughout history. They've always wanted to be this huge world power. I believe there's a correct term for like a providential power. That's the one. They've always wanted to be a providential power. And of course they are very much a big power in their own way, but not in the same regards as, 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 as the USA or the UK or Japan or many other countries like that. I believe, what is it? There's the stat I heard. Russia's current GDP is 1 15th of the USA's. Yeah, it's 1 15th. And with the Soviet mm. Union, I believe that was under Khrushchev, so like the late 50s, early 60s, tops, it was one third. Yeah, that's just saying how much sort of catch up they want to be. But Russia, so I have this sort of theory, and a lot of people agree with it, is that geography shapes history. And Russia is, of course, a country with severely unique geography in the fact it's ginormous. And how Russia came to be that big is, is a story unto itself. It just claimed easily claimable land. To explain it very briefly, you know, a lot of Siberia, no one else was really claiming Siberia, it came under Russian power, so on, so on, so on. And my working theory is that a country that big geographically fundamentally believes it should be that big economically, financially, globally, on the global scale. And there's these theories of why Russia believes so thoroughly. And it's, we've seen it throughout history, we've seen it with the likes of Ivan the Terrible, Stalin, now with Putin. We've seen it with so many leaders. People who run Russia attract a certain kind of personality, it seems. This has just been present throughout history. And Paul, I'm sure you have much more information and many more facts and opinions on this matter. You're talking about a very particular personality. This idea yeah. that Russia needs a strong man mm. to be successful, that it is inherent in Russian governing history and culture, whether that be czarist, whether that be Soviet, or whether that be in the post-Soviet Russian Federation. And there are quite a few people who believe that. And in this case, in terms of the modern incarnation of that, it's not at all surprising that, that that's thought. Think about it. Think about how terrible, if you're familiar with this, the 1990s were for Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were worried about legitimate famine at that point. And that's not a period of time where what you associate with famine in that part of the world, to say the least, the 1990s. Like, you don't, associate, you don't think of famine in Europe. I know Russia goes into Asia as well. I know that in Eurasia. 
in that period of time in a country like Russia has just come off of being one of the world's bigger powers in being the USSR. Yeah, undeniably so. And naturally, one thing that did happen, because it, it was complete economic turmoil, and we can talk about what should have been done, what the West could have done but did not do, but I don't even know that that's even so fundamentally important because those are counterfactuals in this case. What is undeniable, though, is at the end of Boris Yeltsin's tenure in 1999, replaced with the succession to Vladimir Putin, something that happened shortly after Vladimir Putin came into power, 1999-2000, and continued for just a little over a decade afterwards, was significant economic growth. But the question then becomes, why? What mm. changed between that decade and the terror of the economic situation that plagued the 90s with basically the shock therapy transitioning from communism to capitalism that is so often called? And the answer to that question, quite simply, Patrick, is China. Yes, China do play a role in all of this. Throughout the 2000s and through, obviously, part of the early 2010s, to be sure, and it's only now in the last couple of years it's begun to hit the brakes for a number of reasons that we're not going into, they were in an absolute frenzy of construction, whether it be residential, whether it be industrial, whether it be commercial, whether it be infrastructure. And they had a lot of cash to spend to do it. The thing is, in order to do that, they needed certain materials in order to pull that off, all of which could be found in what we would know as former Soviet industries, which still existed in the Russian Federation. So not only were they building like crazy, they needed to buy tons of material that the Russian Federation, in terms of the industry that it had inherited from its Soviet predecessor, in mm. order to do so. And naturally, the economy began to improve likewise. And in that case, so much of that, naturally, was credited to one Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. And then, of course, by 2008, before they had changed the constitutional laws in regards to term limits in terms of president, naturally, he ends up getting succeeded by Medvedev, who, you know, I think most people generally understood <laughs> who was in charge, though clearly not entirely, because there was, there was some minor improvement with the West over that time, but we knew who was pulling the strings, and then guess who comes back, and guess who isn't going anywhere. So, no. you know, at this point, based on the experiences of the vast majority of people who are living in Russia today, they look at Putin and they think to themselves, well, you know, he helped us get out of that terrible situation in the 90s. And it was a terrible situation. There's no question about it. There's no way to put it other than that it was objectively so. And that's true. I, I watched a fantastic documentary. There's a great uh, travel documentary uh, presenter over here in the was Simon Reeve. And he has a three-part series, I believe, exploring Russia. Uh, three, four parts, whatever. It explores the entire country and goes down to Crimea and through Ukraine. Um, this is a few years back now, 2017, I believe. Um, a fantastic documentary that gets you understanding what Russia is like on a ground level in the 21st century. It's a view you don't get all that much. Of course, he gets uh, asked by the police to stop filming in various locations, asked for passports, paperwork. You see that side of Russia, but you see the people of Russia, the good people, like the ordinary people. But you do see, despite our opinion of Putin in the West, he does have tremendous support in some alcoves of Russia. Like, yeah, the, I think he's got quite a large young fan base in parts of Russia, which is just fascinating. You know, he, he's a popular figure to some in the, in the country. He definitely has been generally popular. Naturally, we look at him, and he's very... I remember in a previous episode recently of 80 History, mm. when I said that Putin isn't Stalin. No. And that's for a very good reason, because very few people are Stalin. You yeah. have Hitler, and you have Mao, and you perhaps have Belgium's Leopold I. 
we're, when we're talking about literal body counts and hmm. the not so much in the case of Belgium in this case, but with the other three, Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, ideologically driven totalitarian states. In the case of Putin and the current Russian Federation, it's not a totalitarian state. It is an authoritarian state, without a doubt. And it is certainly personalized power. And insofar as that he is not ideological, he's not trying to spread communist revolution internationally. That's not what he's trying to do. He is now today a firm Russian nationalist. He is of that camp that you described of a providential power that he describes, obviously, the collapse of the Soviet Union more in terms of its power and influence as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And this is, from what I could gather, something that Putin feels Russia needs some nationalism. Because if you read a lot of articles about why is Putin doing this now, the word humiliation comes up an awful lot. Many theorize that Putin feels humiliated by Russia's past about how it failed, how the Soviet Union failed, what happened to the country in the 90s, the land it lost. And he's trying to... to remove that humiliation, try to feel some more pride in this wounded nation as he feels it is. He's, and that's a, another factor why this come on Putin's own humili his perceived humiliation for the country, how it needs to be redeemed by taking back a land that is quote-unquote theirs. Absolutely. So in this mm. case, humiliated by what happened in the 90s, humiliated mm. by the way that the Soviet Union collapsed, humiliated by the way that Russia had been essentially downgraded mm. to a regional power. And he obviously believes that Russia has a greater destiny and that this is the way forward. Now, as far as this goes, let, let's get to 2014, because 2014 yes, yeah. is awfully important here, in which case, naturally, Russia annexes Crimea, and they ultimately have been supporting an uprising of separatists in eastern Ukraine in Luhansk and Donetsk. This definitely contravened and violated what we know today as the Budapest Memorandum. This was conducted in 1994 after the fall of the Soviet Union, where in this case, the states of Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus gave up their nuclear weapons, which they had in their territory because they had been part of the Soviet Union and they still had portions of that former Soviet nuclear stockpile. The caveat being is they didn't have the codes or mechanism to fire them, but they still wanted them to give them up, which is to say that in exchange for giving up those former Soviet nuclear weapons that were still within their borders of their newly found and newly created independent states, they received security guarantees that for doing so, their territorial integrity as it existed at the time would not be violated, and that these guarantees came by the United States, the United Kingdom, and of course the Russian Federation. But when eventually Putin in 2014 decides to annex Crimea, despite all the other implications that that would include, it also meant the violation of the Budapest Memorandum. Now, there is a whole debate about the Budapest Memorandum and the surety of those guarantees, which were obviously not followed through on. That was violated wholly, included what was happening in the Donbass. That is something to keep in mind here because it is historically relevant as well. And when it comes to Crimea, interestingly enough, when he annexed Crimea in 2014, it was a widely popular move in Russia itself because so many of them naturally mm. believe that Crimea was rightly and had long been a part of Russia, going back to the late 18th century when Potemkin essentially conquered it, and specifically Sevastopol, the deep warm water port on the Black Sea, in the name of Catherine the Great. And of course, Crimea has been fought over a great many times in history, to be sure. There's an yeah. entire war after it in, in, in mm. the 19th century. However, in this case... It was a widely popular move. However, with in terms of what happened in eastern Ukraine, originally the plan was to turn that into a province known as Nova Russia, but he did not see that part of it through. And you've had this low-intensity conflict 
in eastern Ukraine ever since, where the Russians have been implausibly denying that they've had any support for it whatsoever, which everybody knows is not the case. And now, when it comes to Ukraine, obviously he has a very serious bone to pick when it comes to the idea that they want to continue move to move closer to the West, to join the European Union, and to join NATO. And the Ukrainians themselves have had a very turbulent early 21st century. You have the color revolutions, and specifically the, the Orange Revolution, which occurred in 2004, which upended an entire election, which they actually redid because it turned out to be clearly corrupt. And there had, you know, there were many, many, many inconsistencies and accuracies in terms of how that was done, as well as chasing off their president back in 2014, which was also a pretext that came for what came in terms of annexing Crimea. And from 2014 onwards, this is, there, there have been two major changes. One is, naturally, the stronger orientation to the West and the idea that they could have a desire to be part of the West, whereas in the case of Russia, at least if you're looking at, say, under the Romanovs, especially when you're talking mm. about, the, you know, from Peter the Great onward, where they considered themselves European and something else. So they're, they're European, but they're also Eurasian in so mm. many respects. So you can almost call my, her I heard one scholar describe it as European plus. But to an extent, this whole idea has somewhat changed when you're talking about the, ex the Soviet experience, where they're trying to take themselves away from the West and very few are allowed in and almost mm. nobody is allowed out, and that the West being capitalist naturally, in addition to a greater Soviet power being aspired to under Ru Russian leadership, which has ultimately embedded this idea today that they're not European, but they're something else. There's no European plus, they are something else, but still a providential power. And this whole idea that countries like Ukraine, like Poland, like Finland even, are starting to sway more towards the EU and NATO especially, that's something that's really scaring him. He doesn't want, because he fundamentally believes that these sort of countries, and this is another great thing I heard, he believes these smaller nations, which obviously compared to Russia, most countries are smaller nations in one way or another. He believes that they aren't real nations, but rather puppet states for larger nations to use in an attack against Russia. So that's why he is so scared of countries like Ukraine or uh, Poland joining NATO. That is an idea that could have been expressed directly out of the mouth of Joseph Stalin. Yes, it really is. This whole idea that no, they're not real countries. They're basically pawns, like pawns on the chessboard of the world that these the states or the united kingdom have poised next to russia's king for lack of a better analogy off the top of my head yeah basically that smaller states will always have their interest and in rights subordinated to larger ones and if by force if necessary yeah just this fundamental concept that these small countries can't exist it's just it's just a big bully really like that's what it comes down to you know russia is described like putin or russia itself putin describes a thug and a bully and it's just hard to not see that when, you, when events like this are unfolding. And Stalin was compared to that as well. Yeah, there, there's no mm. doubt about it. And, you know, in this case, the other part, naturally, in the case of Putin that still bothers him, naturally, is the loss of the Eastern Bloc, which was the Soviets behind closed, door, closed doors called their, their greater empire. Mm. You believe that. Mm. And naturally, Gorbachev, did not resist when eventually what we knew today as the Eastern Bloc that was formalized under the Warsaw Pact occurred. And a lot of the reasons that he, there was not an actual fight in all of that, the fact that it was mostly bloodless except for a few notable days in Romania when the Ceausescus ended up getting put out and shot, you know, for the sake of a better term, actually had a lot to do with the traumatization of their experience fighting during the invasion of Afghanistan that started in 1979, where basically when their greater empire in Eastern Europe ultimately came to an end. And they served a very specific purpose for Stalin after the war, 
which is that he looked at history, including the most recent history where you had Nazi Germany that was basically knocked on their Western doorstep, of being invaded by the West so many times. And what's the best way of guaranteeing that didn't happen again? Well, you have a lot of roadblocks in front of it. Mm. So ultimately, these satellite states, as they're so often called, served as literally a physical buffer. And we're somewhat seeing that now because Belarus have clearly shown their allegiance to Russia. Like We're seeing now that they are some point of a return to that eastern bloc to some degrees obviously it's not it's not as extreme state at least for now at the not, moment not as a communist but no as, as in league with russian interests yeah i mean see yeah that, that's something we're starting to realize right now and it's just interesting times to say the least and now we come to our third player in mm-hmm. this act which has been active in its own way and undeniable which of course is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, formed in 1949, composed mostly of the victorious allies of the Second World War in the West, which I believe expanded during the Cold War to a total of 12 nations that mostly composed Western Europe and North America. And of course, after the Cold War ended, two things came up. One is, naturally, that organization was originally formed as a counter to Soviet power in Eastern and Central Europe, in places like Czechoslovakia, places like Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. You get the idea. Interestingly enough, Mm. not Yugoslavia. That's its own story. But you get the idea. And so once they're gone, the question then becomes, well, what's the purpose of NATO? NATO remains. In fact, The one thing that's most important to understand about NATO is one is it is an open door organization. Anybody can request to join. Request. Just because you request it doesn't mean you get in. Believe me, Mm. despite the fact that Ukraine was making noises of wanting to join NATO, there's a reason why that it hadn't happened at that point and why there did not really seem to be any Western appetite for it to occur. Because they were worried that exactly this, what's happening now, would happen. Russia would throw all its toys at the pram, for lack of a better term. It would serve as a case as Belli. Mm. And so something that I think needs to be discussed here, because it's something that gets thrown around a lot like it is the case, but I can tell you that it didn't happen. There is this belief that the West made a promise to Gorbachev in 1990 that NATO would not expand eastward. This is false. Putin says it all the time. This didn't happen. Now, this is very different, let me point this out here, than having the legitimate discussion of whether they should have expanded east and their policy in undertaking it. But that there was an unequivocal and undeniable promise that this would be the case is not so. So I was doing some digging into this, going into it, because I was more curious about the nature of this. And what I found was, and this is very much where this myth ultimately originates, is that in 1990, when they were undergoing, this is between the West and a lot of cases the United States and the Soviet Union, where diplomatic breakthrough had happened quite significantly up to that point, starting in the second administration of Ronald Reagan, with Gorbachev in regards to discussions over, at the very least, reduction of nuclear arms, Mm. okay? A lot of times Reagan is known as this great anti-communist that overcame the Soviet Union with his toughness. First off, he didn't do anything in his first term to that effect. But when Gorbachev came to power, and this was in Reagan's second term, it turned out that he could find a partner that both sides could work with and wanted to work together. And they had a great deal of success. And that continued under George H.W. Bush, his Reagan, that is, vice president, who ultimately was elected in 1988 as well. And so there's this discussion that in 1990, that representatives of the West made this promise that they would not expand NATO eastward. This is actually what happened. And Gorbachev has gone on record in 2016 saying that this did not happen. Right. We have the guy who is in the room, the guy who would know, yeah. and it's in Soviet and Western documents to confirm this as well. 
what the discussion was had to do with Eastern Germany or East Germany, what we call the GDR, the German, German, uh, the German Democratic Republic, the Soviet satellite state that was created by the Soviets after World War II when Germany was partitioned. Mm. And the agreement was such that until Soviet, uh, and then it turned out Russian forces completely were removed from the country, which might I add, and you can't, I can't even make this up, did not happen completely until 1993 or 1994. That's, That's two crazy. to three years yeah. after the collapse of the Soviet Union. There were still Russian and Russia, that Soviet military forces that were sitting in mm -hmm. East Germany. Most people don't know that. No, no, I didn't know that. It's nuts. Well, until they did that, only German forces, that territorial forces, could be stationed in East Germany, none that were incorporated as forces within the NATO joint command structure, and that there could be no NATO military installations in East Germany. That was the agreement. And it was an agreement that NATO fulfilled. It may have even expanded to beyond when they had already left. I'm not 100% sure about that, Patrick. But the point is, there was never any d even discussion on it. That's a point that is made. There was no even discussion about this. Nobody was thinking at that time that there could be an expansion of NATO into former Warsaw Pact countries, be beyond the German Democratic Republic of East Germany, of course. Yeah. That didn't happen until later. You didn't see NATO expand until 1997, which included the critical former Warsaw Pact countries like Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary be included. Then in 2004, we saw NATO expand into the Baltic state, which is the most controversial and heavily debated expansion of NATO to date. Mm -hmm. Now, you can have a totally legitimate debate about whether that should have happened or not, whether that was a good idea. But it did happen. It did happen. And it was not in any way uh, in violation of some promise that was made. More to the point, it was also very much in league with the NATO-Russia founding treaty from 1997, which one of its critical elements reads as having respect for sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of all states and their inherent right to choose the means to ensure their own security, the inviolability of borders, and people's right of self-determination as enshrined in the Helsinki Final Act and other OSCE documents, which very clearly entails, if you read it, a clear right for any country within the European continent to, at the very least, request inclusion into NATO and eventually be included into NATO. And in 1997, this was a pact that also included the signatories from the United States, in this case, the Clinton administration, and of course, in the case of the Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin. Hmm. This all started coming up when Putin addressed the 2007 Munich Security Conference, which is an annual event. Part of what Putin said in that landmark speech that he made, and I quote, the fact that we are ready not to place a NATO army outside of German territory gives the Soviet Union a firm security guarantee. Where are these guarantees? Close quote. He was referencing and paraphrasing a speech by Manfred Hermann Werner in 1990, who was the Secretary General of NATO. And just like now with Jens Stoltenberg, we have a professional head of NATO that cycles among all of the treaty's members. And when you read about the 1990 speech that Putin was referencing in its entirety, which might add is publicly available, it is very clear that Werner was not talking about making such an indefinite proclamation. Within it, it is very, very clear that he mentioned that this is something that while the situation is good now, as of 1990 when he was making that speech, this was not a permanent condition and should not be understood as such, and that adaptations and other changes in the defense posture can and would be made. But even when these states in 0304 became part of NATO, not until about 2014 was there any actual presence of combat troops. Now, of course, there's this whole idea about the anti-ballistic missile systems that ended up getting ultimately put into Poland, mm 
which the idea behind it in the case of the United States was, well, we have them there to protect against nuclear weapon ambitions of Iran. Mm. But if you're Russia and you're looking at that, you're saying to yourself, why should I believe you? And yeah. what, what means that can't change at the moment's notice? Poland's nearer to me than Iran, so why would you put them in Poland? I'm not a physics major, Patrick. I cannot tell you <laughs> yeah. about the science of the rocket in this case. All I know is that it's super complicated and that it's not a bad vantage point yeah. on yeah. safe territory. But at this point now, naturally, NATO has gone from incorporating the unified Germany to the point in which it now includes a, a vast swath of former Warsaw Pact states and the three Baltic states, which were forcibly annexed into the Soviet Union in 1940, despite the fact that they, after the collapse of the Tsar and even after the Russian revolutions and the creation of the Russian Soviet Federative Republic, which in 1923 becomes the USSR, were themselves independent for 20 years, end up getting for forcibly annexed by Stalin in 1940. And so now even they are part of NATO. So in theory, you, you, you could have NATO tanks, you know, some mm. hundred miles from the border of Estonia to St. Petersburg. Naturally, Putin and company are not that happy about that. No. So it's a legitimate debate, okay? But it happened, and we yeah. are here. And naturally, at this point in time, we kind of get to the present of this whole, this whole war. And for the long time, a lot of people naturally, as you can imagine, had, had been asking the question, what does Putin want? And nobody was entirely sure. He may not have been entirely sure. You know, he, he has this kind of somewhat lionized reputation, if I were to call it anything, about, you know, really just being this incredible calculating mastermind, just exerting pressure so he can get what he wanted without having to fight for it. Mm. But it would appear, based on how things have played out up to the recording of this episode, which, of course, falls on March 1st of 2022. Yes, yeah. That one... The Ukrainians would not only resist him, but fight like hell to resist him. And two, he managed to do something that nobody has been able to do, which of course is unite the European Union yeah. and ultimately be in concert with each other in addition to the support of the United States and Great Britain and NATO and a lot of the world to say, no, we're not putting up with this. Now, naturally, there is no exchange of fire between other European nations, NATO nations, and Russia. I don't think it's terribly complex to understand why, because the whole idea ever since nuclear weapons were developed, especially after you know Joe won in 1949 when the Soviets mm. developed their first nuclear weapon, that the idea that two warring states that were nuclear capable could only go so far before they decide to use their nuclear capability. And destroy the entire planet. Mutually assured destruction. It, it can only be described as auto self-liquidation. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to go there. And even if you manage to strike the other guy first before they're, you know, ostensibly able to respond, it's often thought very likely for everybody who possesses them having what they call a dead hand capability, which is just because they're wiped out doesn't mean that those weapons aren't going to launch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So naturally, there's not a whole lot of that. However, just because you're not going to point a gun at them and fire it yourself doesn't mean that you aren't going to do your best to supply, arm, and train the enemy that your enemy is fighting. And, in which case, naturally, we're supplying Ukraine significantly. And it's just been resounding to see, from what I can gather, how much the Ukrainian people have come together for all this and how much the world has gone to back Ukraine. It's very, one, it, it's oddly wonderful in its own strange way to see so much support being flooded into this part of the world and the support they're giving themselves. And despite being a former actor, comedian, TV personality like Zelensky is doing, from what I can gather, a very impressive job at being a figurehead for this nation, for the world to sort of look upon. 
undeniably. Mm. I think perhaps his most interesting quote was when early on in this conflict, the United States offered to evacuate him, mm. to which he replied, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. <laughs> it, he seems, you know, you can clearly tell he comes from a comedic background with quips of, and, and lies like that and that sort of on-camera charisma, really. Like, he's probably, I, I believe when he first came to power, people were very susceptible. He, he came into power, I think, shortly following... Uh, Trump uh, came into power and Johnson came into power, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but from what I can gather, he's got the support of the nation behind him. It seems more or less the support of the entire planet behind him, at least the Western world behind him, at least it seems. Undeniably, he has done a fantastic job far beyond what anybody would have thought possible in this case. Naturally, it's been incredibly impressive and they're going to keep fighting. Mm. And something, though, it, you know, we're still really early on in this picture, like I said, day eight, as of the time of recording. Mm. Undeniably, the success so far of Ukraine to hold up this invasion is incredible. However, it cannot be denied that there is still a great military imparity that favors Russia in the extreme. No, but this hasn't been a whitewash like so many believed it would be. A lot of people thought, and Putin himself will reportedly thought this would be like done in a day or so like done pretty quickly but even just holding up this much resistance has once again kind of already fed into putin's humiliation sort of his ego is probably quite damaged by it the fact that it's reached day eight absolutely and in this case something you have to ask yourself is what are the russian people how are they viewing this of course and i'm going to be the first to say this well there do seem to be some signs that at the very least, they're ambivalent about it. Mm. It is so hard to get an accurate barometer of how a nation is feeling and supporting in this case, especially in a country that can be as hard to read in terms of communication coming out of there, especially a time like this as Russia. There have been, there have been anti-invasion protests. We've seen that that have been heavily cracked down on which in and of itself is really, really strange. That is, that, that's a huge step for Russia to have anything like that happening. That, 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 it, that's especially amazing. at a time of military conflict. Yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. So we don't know that, but what I can definitely tell you is this, and at least this has been my disposition on it, I'm not going to blame the Russian people for this. Mm. I don't see this as their war by any means. No. But I certainly do feel that way about Putin, and, and I do hope that, uh, you know, assuming that there is a genuine ambivalence, that most people don't want war at this point, not to go after other Russians unless they give good reason to. Mm. You know, at this point, this seems to be Vladimir Putin's personal project. And something that I'm just wondering is how on earth is history going to remember Vladimir Putin now? That's something, like, we always knew he was a questionable, ominous figure, but now that he's flat out, he's brought Europe back to war for the first time since World War II. How, Largest military conflict since World yeah, War II on the continent. Yeah, like how he, he, is he going to, like, and, and, and something, this is perhaps a bit more and more, but how does Putin come out of this whole scenario? Like, just, just how, how, like, part of me is like, how is he going to come out of this alive? That sort of thing. I might sound really terrible and dark, but like, What's the end game for Putin in all of this? Obviously, in his head, it's probably being like the next, the next rule of the Russian Empire, but I, I, I don't know, and it's just it's a big hypothetical for my behalf. That is being determined as you and I record this episode, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. It's hard to know. Obviously, we're talking about there being a great disparity between the two in terms of military capability. Yeah, huge difference. At some point, you would imagine that the Russian military will eventually end up occupying most, if not all, of Ukraine. We don't know that for sure, no. Yeah, we don't know that for sure. It has not happened, but despite this incredible fight back, that's a definite possibility that has to be considered here. And as far as any of that is concerned, we do not know what he has in mind for what Ukraine would look like, how it would be ruled. Would it be simply just incorporated into Russia? Would he have a a handpicked client ruler and government. What is undeniable, though, is that 
It's one thing to win the military conflict, and it is another to try and win the peace and occupy a country of 44 million people, the vast majority of which do not want you there. Mm. And then it turns into the question, well, what does it mean for the rest of the world that had been supporting Ukraine? Well, if you're looking at a scenario where there's going to be a Ukrainian government in exile, chances are the West, certainly under the auspices of NATO, are probably going to begin training, arming, and deploying insurgency into Ukraine. This is not something that would be outside of the playbook in any way whatsoever. It's something that if we get to that point that would probably be very reasonable to expect. The other thing that is undeniable and has only just begun is the refugee humanitarian crisis that's happening in terms of refugees that will ultimately, if they can, flood into Europe. I believe I read somewhere that 50,000 a day are coming into Poland. Yeah, I believe the total at this point is well over 100,000 that have gone yeah. through there or into Hungary. Mm. And the EU has allowed them to stay, I think, at least 90 days without a visa and remain there without having to legally file for asylum for up to mm. three years. I believe in the case of the UK, if you have direct family members and yeah. you're, you're a British national, that they can come and join you. Yes. Even though I'm not sure that that applies to parents and siblings at this point, I think there's some pressure on the current government in the UK to expand it to that extent. We won't get into the politics of refugees and asylum in the UK right now to stop that, this podcast that, that, becoming a, a massive rant. Yeah, and we don't, we don't, we don't need any of that for now. No. But essentially, that's just kind of how it stands, if I understand yeah. correctly. If, yes, is that, yeah, was yeah. that an accurate assessment? That okay. is a very accurate assessment. Yeah, it's a developing story over here. What we're doing, obviously, we're not part of the EU anymore, so we don't do their rules or do things yeah, like they do. Doing do. your We've own thing, doing our own thing, and that's being debated and or scrutinized as we speak, more or less. And as far as the U.S. is concerned, obviously, we're a long way away mm, from mm. what's happening there right now, but. We'll see what happens on that front as well. Yeah. However, one thing that's undeniable is that, and this is something I really want to emphasize to whoever is listening to us or watching us, wherever you may be, this situation right now, though it seems to be isolated to Russia and Ukraine and the fringes of Eastern Europe now that are beginning to get flooded in with refugees, and Belarus to an extent because of how closely aligned they are to Russian interests, this can get dangerous and large very quickly. Mm -hmm. Far more quickly and far more dangerous than any of us currently anticipate. Just a couple of days ago, even Putin, whether he was signaling or whether he was serious, it's kind of hard to believe he was totally serious, but you have to treat him as such, obviously started making threats rattling the nuclear saber. Mm -hmm. And at this point, there's a lot of scrutiny in terms of the words that he used in our understanding of Russian military practices. However, from a nuclear perspective, if you're looking at it as an American, right now, the nuclear posture of Russia is the American equivalent of DEFCON 2. The last time we were at DEFCON 2 and here in the United States was in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 where even Robert yeah. McNamara at the time was Kennedy's Secretary of Defense and went on to be Johnson's Secretary of Defense, in hindsight, being mm. so intimately involved in that, basically said, we got lucky. We came this close to nuclear war. And so when you're talking about nuclear arms and you're talking about militaries and alliances and powers with this much capability and this much at stake, it can get very dangerous very quickly. But the point I want to leave out on is this. Mm. Whether it was the Cold War, whether it's today, and whether you accept this or not, everybody wonders why we can't have, at least in the West, a better relationship with Russia. Because the something that I think a lot of people tend to discount is the idea that just because we can get along interpersonally on a human level with people from all over the world, that whatever culture they come from, whatever it may be, that doesn't usually always translate on the state level in terms of high politics. Every leader, even ones that are in alliance with others, their primary responsibility is to the interests and values of the powers that they're leading. And when it comes to the West, 
when it comes to the EU, NATO, Britain, the United States, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, or the Soviet Union. None of it is a misunderstanding. This is a fundamental clash of interests and values. And while that can be managed, right now we are most certainly seeing the most fundamental differences between the two. And that's not to say that either both sides don't have blood and dirt on their hands. You know, no one's mm. innocent. But the reality is, on a fundamental level, especially when you're talking about high state politics, there is a fundamental clash of interest and values. Don't translate that to the personal level, because we can all get along down here. Mm. But up there, anything can happen. It's happening for a reason. And whatever the case may be, given how dangerous and how out of hand this can get very quickly, if there is one thing that I would implore our audience to do, is be thankful, whatever your lot may be, that for the most part you can lead the life you want to live, that you have people in your life that you love and care about you, and for all intents and purposes, don't forget to tell them once hmm. or twice today after listening or watching this episode. Because given where we are and given our capabilities, not to get too dark, but all of that can change dramatically in an instant. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Patrick? Uh, the one thing I want to say now, Paul, is f you, you forever amaze me with the bastion of knowledge you have in regards to Russian history as well as Russian current affairs. So I'm very fortunate to have you personally explaining all of this to myself and, of course, the AD listener viewership are also incredibly fortunate to have your mind, to have yourself explain all of this to them. Thank you very much, Paul, because you you're an expert in this field and it's, it, 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 there's no one else I'd rather be talking to about this than yourself. And I'm very fortunate that I'm actually the one who gets to the talking as opposed to just listening. I am incredibly complimented <laughs> and flattered by that, Patrick. But like yourself and like everybody listening, I am no expert. I am simply a keen student. And I hope that the information that I communicate is accurate, sound, and worthy assessment to help provide some additional information to whoever's watching or listening to us to better understand how we got here today, why we are here, and what is at stake. And I could not be luckier to have a co-host that is as intellectually curious and thoughtful and asks such good questions and the pleasure of working with a professional colleague and friend as wonderful as you. So thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that too, Paul. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, we just need to say, Paul, we haven't really said this yet, our sincerest best regards and thoughts and best wishes goes to everyone affected by this invasion. Whether you're in Ukraine, know someone who is in Ukraine, any relation at all, if this is affecting you in any way, shape or form, we hope you're doing well. This is undeniably true, and we'd like to thank you for listening to this very special and unique episode of the 80 History Podcast. And wherever you are, whatever you may be doing, whatever your lot is, we send our best to you. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming 80 History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found.